computer. There you go. So I am actually not at home. I'm in Crested Butte. So I am sitting in the lobby of the hotel and we'll hope everything goes a-okay. The internet was not working consistently in my room. So here we are. All right, so I'm gonna be letting folks in as we go. Let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, slideshow from the beginning. Okay, Denver through the decades, 1920s. We have come a long way, baby, as they say. And we are on into the 1920s. So we're just going to go as normal. Okay, here's my contact information if any of you need it. And then on we go. Okay, just some fun things or just some things about the 1920s. Uh, not necessarily in Denver, but around Denver and beyond that have had an effect on Denver. So uh, 1920, I had already learned that some of the story about Douglas Fairbanks uh, in relation to Elitches. And I'm gonna silence my phone so that no one rings me up during the presentation. Uh, so I'd already learned about him with Elitches and I was excited to report that in 1920, he did his first uh, movie, The Mask of Zorro. I've never actually seen it. So one of these days I need to see it so I may see what it's like. So that was 1920. 1920 also gave us the Army Medical Hospital number 21 being renamed Fitzsimmons. This had been put in during the Great War and we had a soldier from Denver die, and so they renamed it in his honor. So that's 1920. 1921, they had the big flood in Pueblo. Most of you probably already know that if you know your general Colorado history. At that time, Pueblo was on track to be the number two city of importance in Colorado and just set it back. It never recovered its preeminence in the state. Today, Pueblo is the ninth largest city in the state. It took years, even the rest of the decade to recover. And of course, then in the 1930s, things were wretched. So poor Pueblo could have been something much bigger if it hadn't been for that flood. Another thing, which I think we tend to forget, the Colorado River was originally called the Grand River, which is why it's called Grand Junction. That's where the Gunnison and the Grand River came together. It was renamed in 1921. We had a senator in Colorado who felt that it was absolutely a crime that this river did not bear the name of Colorado because this is where it started. So he moved for that to be done. And where is it? I wrote down the name of the act, but it's not. I can't find it in my notes. So that was in 1921. 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act uh, was signed. That was signed by President Coolidge. And this codified the fact that American, Indian, uh, American Indians, Native Americans actually were American citizens. Prior to this, it had been a hodgepodge of legislation at the state and low, uh, federal level dictating citizenship right for Native Americans. And this was our really first main act to try to move toward having a uniform piece of legislation at the national level. Uh, it did continue for a while before we had true inclusivity. I wrote, I did a lot of reading for that part because it was something I had not actually known a lot about. Uh, this didn't mean everything was actually completely done. It would be uh, 1938, seven states did not allow Native Americans to vote because that aspect of it was still done at the local level. So it would still take a while. 1926 in Colorado Springs, the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo opens. 1928, the Moffat Tunnel opens. This was the plan for connecting Denver with Salt Lake City. Today, for those of you who take the train west out of Denver, you still use the Moffat Tunnel. So that's still up there. And the Royal Gorge Bridge was finished in 1929. 
what a great year to finish a project like that, I guess. Maybe not so much because of course the next year things took a turn for the worst. Oh, so just a few things around uh, Colorado and the nation which had an effect on Colorado and on Denver certainly, which is of course the focus of our evening. Okay, so I've been showing you these, each of our presentations. Again, these are put out by a colleague of mine at Denver Urbanism, so I did not put these out. So a shout out to Denver Urbanism for these wonderful maps. If you look there at the map, you're gonna see the current city of Denver boundaries with its neighborhoods as delineated by the city. The gray spots are where you had development, house, business, et cetera, prior to the 19 teens. During the 19 teens, what you see here, the red, that's what would have gone in during that decade. So I'm just gonna move forward, backward and forward several times here so that you get the fun of it. So the 19 teens, 20s, and 30s. So as you see, holy guacamole, the 1920s, we had a lot of development. We were especially developing off there to the east, southeast, and northwest. So 19 teens, 1920s, 1930s. Now, my mother-in-law lives in the College View neighborhood. So if you look sort of the southwestern edge of the city, with that big finger of Inglewood that sticks up there. If you notice in the 19 teens, there was really nothing to speak of there. But the 1920s, the neighborhood begins to be expanded and the 1930s, it really gets going. So you can see some of these spots just beginning to come into the city's consciousness at that time. All right, this was a map that I wanted to bring up because during this time period, we had really solidified into our boundaries. So I do have uh, this map. If you would like to have a copy of this map, just email me. I will email you the link. This map is highly detailed and you can zoom in on it and see just impressive detail. The west side of the city, which is to your left, that's Sheridan. The east side of the city over there, that is Yosemite. Those are our current boundaries, Aurora on the east and other cities are on the west, Lakewood, Wheat Ridge, et cetera. The northern boundary there generally follows its current boundary there near I-70. The southern boundary, we do have a lot of differences though. You see that little lobe sticking down. The farthest low point there would be Yale, which is our current boundary, but the sides, my goodness, the right-hand side, that's Colorado Boulevard. We now go much farther southeast than that. And the west side over there, uh, that's going to be the area near Federal and such, and we go now much farther southwest than that. So the 1920s, and next month we're going to talk about the 1930s, those will be the last decades when this map is really going to be accurate. So this is what we're working with in the 1920s. Just wanted to show you how much of the city is already fully accessible by streetcar. I realize it's kind of blurry here. Uh, this is what you get when you have a giant map and you have to concentrate it down into a really tiny area. Okay, so most of you who've toured with me before or uh, just heard me speak before, you know that a favorite subject of mine would be the streetcars. So we're going to come to an exciting moment for the streetcars during this time. The streetcars were begun in the winter of 1871-72. We already talked about that in our presentation uh, covering the 1870s. By 1899, all of those streetcar companies had been whittled down to one company, the Denver Tramway Company. And from 1899 moving forward to the eventual dismantling of the streetcars, it would have been a monopoly. So when you have a monopoly, things can sometimes get a little unsavory. You may remember that the 19 aughts and the 19 teens were a great era of monopoly breaking. So finally, we have some folks in Denver who wanted the monopoly broken. So in 1920, we had our one and only streetcar strike. So I've got a lot to share on that. One contemporary wrote, quote, streetcars are equipped with all the modern conveniences including hot and cold conductors and running transfers. This modern octopus 
rules the great highways of our teeming cities with an ironed, iron hand and a steel franchise. So the tramway companies, they could already see sort of that whole writing in the wind, writing on the wall. In the 19 teens, we could see that cars were going to begin be, uh, coming an impediment for our streetcars. But the uh, streetcar company, the Denver Tramway Company, did not want to change anything. So in 1920, we had a strike. The strike was mostly over a change in hours, a raise. Uh, uh, they wanted a raise, so they wanted their pay to be increased. Uh, the Denver Tramway Company was not interested in that. They said that we need to be able to compete with other forms of transportation coming in. The 1920s would give us our first buses in Denver and they needed to be able to compete um, just, or not, not compete, they needed to keep up with other tramway companies around the country. So a strike was formed. You see in this picture, the state capital there in the distance, the street we are on right here, this is Colfax. If you look at the gentleman on the right hand side there, those gentlemen are standing basically in front of the Cathedral Basilica of the, excuse me, it's not the Cathedral Basilica at this time, they are just in front of the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. So that would be just off the uh, photograph to the right hand side. So the strikers, what they decided to do was uh, destroy a few things. So this uh, set of streetcars, they actually knocked them over as you see, they did allow the passengers to get off the streetcar first. Some other streetcars were burned. Here is a picture of one of those burned out streetcars. You can see uh, the roof completely missing there, pretty much. And here is one of those streetcars on fire. So another nice little note, they did let the people off the streetcar before they burned them. They even went into the offices of the Denver Post at, uh, because the Denver Post supported the tramway company and they ransacked the post offices. They went into the offices of the Dr Denver Tramway Company as well and they ransacked those buildings. So the strikers caused all kinds of pandemonium around the city. So let me look here. Okay, just checking my checking my internet here because it said my internet is unstable. Ooh. Your audio is in and out. Okay. Uh -huh. Are you able to hear me now? Hold on a moment. Okay. Does it do better without the headset? Okay. I can hear you, but you keep okay. cutting out. Okay, so we're gonna try again without the headset. Okay, so we continue. Okay. This is part of the fun of being in a different place. Technical difficulties. Okay, so the strike ended up doing no good to the strikers. Uh, there was actually no concession made to the streetcar company or to the uh, streetcar workers. They didn't give them anything and in the end, uh, the strike was a stalemate for them. In the end, seven people were killed as part of the strike. It was not strikers or strike breakers who were killed. It was people who had turned out just to watch what was going on. And when shots were fired, uh, some unlucky people were killed and seven people just lost their lives because they were there to watch the strike be broken. Okay, so 1920, the decade starts with uh, some unhappiness there. So there is that. Okay, we continue. Some things that you don't really think about so much. Today, we have access to the internet. We have 
oh, cable TV, radio, all these wonderful things. But we forget that we didn't always have that sort of thing. Believe it or not, Denver got its first rail uh, radio station back in 1920. So hold on, let me let someone in. Okay. So our first radio station in Denver was KLZ at 560 megahertz. It was a commercial AM radio station, and it was originally licensed in, licensed in uh, it was actually begun in Colorado Springs, but he almost immediately moved to the city of Denver, where it received its licensure. Um, it got that license March 10th, 1922, and it was the first and is the oldest broadcasting station in the state of Colorado. It is among the oldest in the United States. The gentleman that you see there on the right-hand side, that is Dr. William Reynolds, who gave up dentistry to become a full-time broadcaster. He loved playing with radios. In fact, loved it so much that he gave up a career in order to be a radio broadcaster. He was a huge fan of all of the latest technologies and anything that would help him uh, broadcast a little bit farther. So if you look there on the left-hand side, this so shows his house, which has on top of it, this giant antenna, which helped him reach farther than even before. He also experimented in other things that would uh, bring in greater radio listens, listening ship. I'm not sure, uh, radio attendance, I guess. They had an opera at the Denver Auditorium. He broadcast that. Uh, he went around to other places and found things that could be broadcast, and they put that out onto the radio waves. This encouraged people to go out to buy a radio. So this was one of those technologies that came to us during this decade. So 1920, we do get our first radio station. Okay, in the 1920s, we also got some politicians of note. Now, one of them, if you know your Denver history or even modern Denver, it is a name that you know, and that is this person here, Ben Stapleton. So of all of the mayors ever to work for the city of Denver, he is the one that served the longest. He was mayor 1923 until 1931, and then he served again from 1935 until 1947. So the 1920s would give us Ben Stapleton. The 1920s would also give us this man here. Now, this is Clarence Morley. Morley was governor from 1925 until 1927. Now, Morley is being uh, very famous in Colorado history for being our Klan governor. He was definitely a wholehearted member of the Ku Klux Klan. And this is a story that a lot of people don't realize from the 1920s, the rise and fall of the Klan in Colorado. So uh, a, an author, or not an author, excuse me, a historian, for the Auraria Library wrote, so I'm just going to read this out to you. Speaking about Clarence Morley, his vitriol toward all things un-American was thinly veiled as an attack on Catholics and further on immigration. His goal was not simply to eliminate the use of demon alcohol by banning the use of sacramental wine. It was also to stop key elements of Catholic practice and thus the religion itself. Morley espoused the view that if public schools weren't good enough for Catholic children, then Catholics should not teach in public schools. He agitated for the University of Colorado to fire all non-Protestant professors. So these two men came into politics in Colorado during this time. And the Klan came into power in Colorado at this time. By the time Clarence Morley was in an office, the Ku Klux Klan basically had infiltrated all elements, all levels of Colorado government, from police officers and police chiefs and local magistrates and mayors, all the way up to the legislature, the executive branch under Morley. So you may say that the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan in Colorado at that time who was known as Dr. John Galen Locke, 
thus was the true person in charge of Colorado, because all of these folks would have taken some degree of uh, word from him as to what they should and should not do. So the Klan definitely had a lot of power at this time. One of the things that we're trying to figure out now is how to reconcile our thoughts on this person right here. Ben Stapleton definitely was a member of the Klan. We can see his membership listings within the Klan. So he joined and was listed and, uh, as Klan roster member number 1128. So we do have evidence of his membership in the Klan. One of the things uh, that was common at the time would have been for business people to join the Klan. It was considered to be good business practice as a way to get your word out there and get your business supported. Weirdly, one of the things that I had not known is that being part of the Klan was also seen as a social activity. They had parties and picnics and hike, hiking trips and all these things. And so people were able to get out and about with the Klan, weirdly enough, for social activities. So Stapleton here, uh, when he was running for office, he officially renounced groups like the Klan saying, and I quote, true Americanism needs no mask or disguise. Any attempt to stir racial prejudice or intolerance is contrary to our constitution and is therefore un-American. However, it was quite common for politicians at that time, folks running for office to say things like that in order to get into office. Now, Mayor Stapleton did do great things for the city. He helped to put in the Valley Highway, which later became I-25. Red Rocks Amphitheater was brought into the city and uh, updated into its current form during his administration. Much of the Denver water system, many of our Denver mountain parks, the municipal airport that would later bear his name came into existence through his work. Clarence Morley, his time in office was really only two years he would be removed from office with the general removal of the Klan from power in Colorado. So we did have numerous activities. There are lots of pictures of Klan activity throughout the city and state. So we do know that they were out there and flexing their muscles. So this is a Klan march right through the center of town um, I found lots of pictures out there. There are many of them. If you want to go look yourself, uh, History Colorado recently did a, a full, uh, what's the word, uh, exhibit on the Klan in Colorado. This is one of the pictures that they have from their collection. It shows that women members were also out there doing their thing with the Klan. And uh, you have in the foreground, they even put a baby into Klan uh, clothing. So there was a lot going on with the Klan at this time. That is not to say that folks did not stand against them. There were plenty of those who were fighting against what the Klan was doing in Colorado. This is St. Anne's in Arvada. St. Anne's really tried to spearhead the work against the Klan in Colorado. There was a lot of anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant sentiment, and the folks there who went to this church and lived in the community worked with others, such as parishioners at uh, Regis, a little bit to the south, and they had a march between these two uh, areas from St. Anne's and uh, Regis University. They had a march between them to support those who fought against the Klan. So... In the end, uh, the Klan would lose its grip on power. The alliance between the Klan and Stapleton would come to its end. In 1925, Stapleton ordered a series of raids on bootleggers, gamblers, uh, prostitutes, and they exposed a lot of bribes and payoffs that had involved a Klan vice squad. This would lead to some other ex- uh, exposés that expose, expose the fact that the Klan was basically uh, flouting a lot of tax laws 
So once they got in trouble for not paying their taxes, that was the end of the clan. So the full expression of power of the clan in Denver was actually quite brief, but it did leave a very ugly legacy. Recently, uh, the full rosters of clan membership in uh, Denver uh, came to light. That is now available online, I believe. So uh, believe it or not, my in-laws, my mother-in-law was able to look up and find her grandfather listed as a Klansman in Denver. So kind of crazy times. Okay, let's move on to something happier now. Let's talk about candy. Okay, Russell Stover Candy actually got started in Denver. So back in 1923, Clara and Russell Stover began making candy in their Denver bungalow. So that's the house that you see on the upper left-hand side there. Uh, the company initially had just seven employees and was known as Mrs. Stover's Bungalow Candies. And that was in 1923. Uh, it proved to be hugely popular. Folks loved the candy. So what they ended up doing is deciding to move. So they did uh, not move, I'm sorry, franchise. So they did open franchises uh, with five stores in Denver, as well as stores in Kansas City, Lincoln, Omaha, and St. Louis. And again, folks loved them. They were delicious. So in 1928, they moved their uh, company uh, farther east. They opened more in Kansas City, and they did move completely into Kansas City in 1932. So Russell Stover's uh, was not in Denver forever, not even a decade, but it did start in Denver. So if any of you have ever, ever eaten Russell Stover candies, then you have uh, a Denver piece of chocolate there that you're enjoying. Okay, so one of the things that came to us during this time period, as we had with Mayor Stapleton, was our first airport in Denver. So where the Park Hill Golf Course is today, that was our original airport that was used for Lowry before Lowry opened. And uh, as you see, just had two runways. Charles Lindbergh would land there in 1927 with his famous airplane, the Spirit of St. Louis. It did stay there overnight. Uh, eventually, as Lowry moved to its current location, this became uh, Combs Field. So I'm going to show you a picture of that. Oh, here's uh, the Spirit of St. Louis. Forgot I had this picture in here. Of course, the Spirit of St. Louis, super duper famous because it was the flight, uh, the first plane to fly transatlantic. So he went on this tour. Members of the public came out in great numbers to see him. Well, after Lowry takes its uh, location a little bit farther east, we had it become the Combs Aircraft Company location. So there was a gentleman, Mr. Harry Combs, who had flown during the first war, the Great War, and he loved it. So he didn't want to give it up. So when he came back to the United States, he stuck with it, and eventually he bought the 204 acres of Lowry and he set up business there, Mountain States Aviation. Now it was later renamed Combs Aircraft Corporation and he kept on with business. Uh, many of the soldiers who were going to be fighting in the Second World War went to this location in order to study before they went off to war. We also had troop transport planes that were carrying soldiers uh, to the East Coast and West Coast. And we had uh, folks fly missions over the North Atlantic, Africa, and even uh, India from this location. Now, eventually, what is now the Park Hill Golf Course uh, got that way because Stapleton Airport didn't want to share its airspace with this location. So this location would be shut down, which would pave the way for it to become the Park Hill Golf Course. Now, the picture that you see here is a modern picture. There are only two aircraft hangars still standing from 
the time when it was an airport. I uh, have this picture on here to show you uh, that there are some signs left of that. The Ed Dwight studio used to be up in this area as well. Okay, we continue. The 1920s also would be the great era of themed theaters in the city of Denver. Now, uh, there had been a few theaters uh, just beginning uh, the last decade. So 1918, 1919, we got a few theaters in there, but the 1920s is really when we got our explosion of theaters in Denver. So this one here is one of the ones that opened and this opened in 1927 as the Santa Fe Theater. So the Southwestern theme, they were excitedly sharing with you. It had that wonderful Spanish motif costing about $150,000. It could seat about a thousand people with the upstairs balcony uh, included. It had an organ because of course, when you have your silent movies, you have the organ playing music to go with the movie. Uh, I want to read you something in the newspaper from that opening movie. This handsome new movie house was ablaze with lights and the crowds began pouring into the doors when they opened at 645. By 715, every seat in the house was filled and throngs of people waited on the pavement for the next showing two and a quarter hours later and completely filled the theater for the second performance. What was that first movie? On November 1st, 1927, why it was women's wares. Now, one of these days, I am going to try to find this movie because I have never seen it and I have talked about it so many times, I want to watch it. So it included the beautiful uh, lady that you see here on the left-hand side, Evelyn Brent, who was quite scandalous. There are some pictures out there of her on the internet She's not nude, but she is exposing a lot of skin in some of those pictures. And so she was a bit of a, a scandalous dame to have in a movie. And up here in the upper right-hand side, you have the heavily, uh, heavily handsome fellow at the time, Bert Lytell. Now it's important that you don't see his teeth here in this picture. If you ever see him smile, his uh, teeth would not pass today but apparently in the 1920s, they were A-OK. -okay. So the movie Women's Wears is what they had uh, for their first movie on opening night. And the movie, uh, excuse me, the movie theater also had an exciting new addition. It had, quote, uh, the technologies of the day and was built where you could park your car. This was an important indication of what the future was going to be for oh, this. Well, you had it on full screen. So if you look which at- Which hides the control for- Hold on a moment. Okay, if you look, there is also a star in front of the theater. They have a super tiny walk of fame. I think there are really only three stars. And here is one I took a picture of the Red Hot Chili Peppers performed here in 1987. So this theater, it needs some love. If any of you have several million dollars and you don't know what to do with it, the owner of this uh, theater is trying to sell it, but he does want it to remain a theater. Okay, let us continue. Okay, another one of the things that came in during this time period would be what we know now as the Stapleton International Airport. When it opened in 1929, it was called the Denver Municipal Airport. It was the expansion from where we had been there in what is today Park Hill. We needed uh, more runways, we needed longer runways, and we needed more space in general. So the Denver Municipal Airport opened in 1929 to serve in that capacity. So this is a picture from a shortly after opening day. Uh, not too long. I couldn't find any pictures from 1929, but this is not too long after that. And of course, it would later be renamed Stapleton in honor of that long serving mayor in Colorado or in Denver, excuse me. So the airport would later 
uh, be known for its runways going over the interstate. So here you have uh, those famous tunnels where you could go under the interstate. I do remember them. They are now gone. So all of that concrete was later recycled elsewhere for reuse. So we don't have that anymore. The airport would expand. And of course, we came to modern day to the moving in the 1990s out to our current airport. Here you have Governor uh, Hickenlooper and Mayor Wellington Webb signing the documentation for that to be moved out to its current location, uh, DIA. This would allow us to have Stapleton remade. So this brings us up to one of our current arguments over the day and that is the retention of the name. So this is a story I'm not gonna get into too much. There are numerous articles out there on the internet that talk about the yes or the no of renaming things that are honoring people from our past when we find out that they had some unpleasant aspects of their, uh, of their lives. So currently Stapleton is uh, under its new name, Central Park. Uh, a lot of people still use Stapleton because they haven't gotten used to the new name of Central Park, but that officially is rebranded as Central Park. So the Stapleton name uh, is disappearing from Denver. We shall see if we ever have it gone completely. Okay, so another thing that, of course, that happened during this time period, 1929, was the crash. Now, we are going to talk more about the effect of the Great Depression on Denver when we go about uh, our, the 1930s. When we talk about the 1930s, we will have a lot more to say because it was really only at the very end of the 1920s that that happened. So here's a picture of one of those uh, soup lines in Denver. So that'll be coming up in our next presentation, but I did wanna acknowledge it at least so you do know that it did start at least in the 1920s. Okay, now this is something we're still struggling with today, and that is the signing of the Colorado River Compact in 1922. So the Colorado River Compact, a landmark agreement, which uh, delineated how water from the Colorado River was going to be used. So the compact was signed between the seven states that are uh, watered or or put water into the Colorado River, and they're divided into two sections, the upper states, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico, and the lower states, Arizona, Nevada, and California. And the aspects of this piece of legislation we are still dealing with today. So some of the pieces uh, that we're looking at are the rules around prior appropriation. Uh, water law dictates that when you use it, if you be the first person to use it, well, that kind of means that you get to keep it first in use, uh, first in right. So you also have to have beneficial use, lawful and prudent. I wrote it down, the actual description of what beneficial use means. Lawful and prudent use of water that has been diverted from a stream or aquifer for human or natural benefit. So this compact talks about... Uh, all of these legal aspects of who gets it. At this time, it is super important that you remember that the population in the 1920s was very heavily in favor of California. So you didn't have a Las Vegas, Nevada at this point. There wasn't as much going on in Phoenix and Tucson. Salt Lake City was there, yes, uh, Albuquerque, Santa Fe and such. But these cities don't get a lot of their water from the Colorado River. So uh, the great cities of the southwestern part of Colorado also were not as much there. Another thing that was problematic is this piece of legislation was written at a time when we were seeing higher than average precipitation in the basin. So they used numbers that are not really reflected in general within the basin. So we're still fighting over this today. So 19, the 1920s really would uh, be a time for making some great mistakes 
for how we deal with water in Colorado. Okay, so I do have some more things to say, but I'm going to go over this now before I forget and run out of time. I'm afraid of running out of time. Okay, so I have done a special pre-recorded presentation called 10 Around Town. And the only people who are learning about this are you folks here watching this presentation. Uh, between now and I think it's midnight Sunday, you have the uh, option of getting this presentation. If you purchase a treasure box or any of our day tours, this presentation, this pre-recorded presentation will be sent to you. It is a presentation on 10 things around the metropolitan area that I think you need to see. I don't say favorite because as we know, favorite means one. It's just 10 things that I think you should go see. Some of you are going to know about them, yes, uh, but I think many of you will not know about most of them. So if you'd like to get this presentation, you would just need to get a treasure box or a day tour any, uh, between now and midnight Sunday night. So that's 10 around town. So my person who advises me on the world of uh, marketing, she said, ooh, let's give this a try, see what we can do. So that's what we're doing. Okay, so some upcoming presentations. Uh, Grand Mesa is next week. Uh, we did have uh, a number of folks cancel. So this uh, tour is under its minimum. Uh, we're going to run it anyway. It's a long story. So if any of you would like to join, it's a five day tour next week. We could use some, some bodies on it. Rocky Mountaineer, uh, which is gonna be a very elegant trip in September uh, coming up. What is that, four days, our Western Slope wineries. You don't even have to be a drinker. I'm a teetotaler, lifelong teetotaler, and I still go on the tour and have a fine time. Geology 201, you don't have to know diddly bupkis about geology. And Longmont, we're gonna go up and have a tour there. Uh, you may know all about Longmont, but we're gonna see some things that you don't normally see. Uh, there's a photovoltaic farm in Longmont, and who goes up to see that? No one. So this might be something you'd like to join us in or on any of these tours. We still have some space, so please consider it. Um, so I wanted to talk about this picture here before we actually answer some questions. So I mentioned earlier in the 1920s that this became the era of the themed theater in Denver. So what ended up happening, uh, one of the things we talked about in the 19 aughts presentation was the creation of the city auditorium, which is today's Ellie Calkins Opera House. So that created sort of this nucleus of entertainment within Denver there at the intersection of 14th and Curtis. Well, when the theaters started going in around Denver, we decided, well, we need to put some in downtown Denver. So Curtis Street became the nexus of our uh, movie and concert and lecture row within Denver. So this picture that you're seeing right here, this is Curtis Street looking toward the Southeast toward what is today the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, but you obviously don't see that here because it doesn't exist at this point. Um, the city auditorium would be way at the end on the left. You can't even really see it in this picture. So the theaters came up and as you can see, they covered all of them with these wonderful neon signs. So look at the one here on the far right. That one just makes me so happy. The chop suey, my goodness, back in the day, of course there was no political correctness. They did whatever they wanted to, and you decided which one you were going to go to, and then that was a good thing or not. So as you see, it has the streetcar going up and down it, and these began their iteration in the 1920s. So there is a wonderful old book that talks about, the, about these theaters, when they went up, what each one had. So if you want me to send you a link to that, let me know. I'd be happy to share it with you. So this is a picture from the 1920s as well. And the lights here burned so brightly that Thomas Edison, the fellow who kind of gave us the electric light bulb, he said after a visit to Denver 
that there was no place on the surface of the earth that glowed as brightly as Curtis Street in Denver, which I think is amazing that this was the top of the line. So we outshone Times Square in New York City before Times Square got to that point. So this presentation, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share here and we're just gonna come back to the regular screen. I don't think I pasted out correctly. So I'm ending a little bit early today, unfortunately. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, since I knew I was coming up to Crested Butte, I was uncertain of how much time I was going to have. So here in my hotel in Crested Butte, we're just gonna end it a little bit early. So at this point, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat window. I'm going to put my contact information in the window again, so that if you have any questions, you may shout out. I apologize for ending early. I'm normally very good about that. And I also apologize for the audio issues at the beginning. Um, I guess next time I won't design this to overlap with the tour. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat window. Thank you, having a good time in Crested Butte. We're doing our own personal flower tour here. Uh, so we're having a great time. Um, any questions, just put them into the chat window. I hope you're all staying nice and cool. And I'll just watch for a couple minutes and see if we have any, uh, any questions. Otherwise, go have a great dinner, which is what I'm gonna do in just a few moments. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll just ramble while we're waiting. We've been having a lot of hikes and walks. So we've seen a lot of flowers. I've learned that I do not want to grow stickweed forget-me-nots because apparently it has burrs that will stick to your clothing and skin. So that's my lesson from Crested Butte, even though it's a really pretty plant. Okay, what was the dentist's name who did the radio? Certainly. Okay, so I'll get his name right. I'll just make sure I have it here. Dr. William Reynolds. So this is actually, who did I say? Okay. KL, KLZ 560 megahertz. Kilohertz, not megahertz. Hmm. Okay, Ernest, Ernest Kemper, Ernesto, he knows better than I do. So I probably wrote that wrong. So thank you, Ernesto. Um, and as far as the fellow, there is a lot of information out there about him. So if you'd like to read more about his story and use some uh, pictures, can you talk about prohibition and the roaring 20s in Denver? Sure. All right, let me think here. You know, actually, I should totally have talked about prohibition. Duh, I did not even put that in there. Okay, that was an oversight on my part. Okay, so Colorado went dry in 1916. So we went, for, we went dry four uh, years before the nation did so. Uh, for four years, as I understand it, we had a lot of Oh, what is it called? Bootlegging liquor from Wyoming down into the Front Range. So the folks in Wyoming were super happy because they could run all of this, uh, these legal alcohol creating places up in Wyoming and bring it down into Colorado and make tons of money. But of course, in 1920, it all went dry. So this is something we actually talked about in the last presentation where we talked about why prohibition happened. There was a lot of very virulent anti-immigrant sentiment in the United States. It was believed that many of these um, fraternal and um, fraternal orders and meeting halls that were for the Germans or the Saxons or the Slovenians or the Italians were hotbeds of anti-Americanism. And so if you got rid of the alcohol, then these places would close which meant that they would be forced to become Americans. They would be forced to integrate. So in the 1920s, even though we talked about that more in the 19 teens presentation, what in the 1920s, what you saw was the death of all of these, almost all of these places that had been for immigrants. So there are remnants all around the metropolitan area. I did a tour in Globeville where we saw, it was called, oh, Kendall entered the waiting room. She's awfully late to be entering the waiting room. Um, we saw a place, it was called Saxonia Hall in Globeville. We saw another one that was for Slovenian people and they just died. They all 
went kaput without alcohol, they could not sustain themselves. So that was an aspect of the 1920s. And of course, there is a, a general consensus that prohibition led to the rise of the gangsters in uh, the United States. So I actually, I will tell you from the fullness of my heart, that is not a story I know. I am going to be going on my first gangster tour with Treasure Box Tours in August or September. It is a story that has never super appealed to me, so I have never looked into it. So I'm going to learn about it myself in a month or two. So if you don't know about it, the fellow is going to be giving, giving us a full tour. You may join us and learn all about it while I learn about it. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm unable to help you. As far as the Roaring Twenties, everything you know about the Roaring Twenties with the short hairs and the short hair and the skirts coming up was totally happening in Denver. If you look at uh, the pictures of, of the theaters in Denver at that time, it's going to show you uh, many of those women doing their thing. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Baby Doe Tabor, her second daughter, uh, silver dollar this would have been the time when she fell into uh, the disrepute of being an actress which would later uh, have her spurned from all good society before she later was scalded to death so thank you for reminding me about prohibition um, that actually would have been a good one to touch on even though i think we mostly hit it uh, what led up to it in our last presentation Oof. okay any other questions it's funny too, all of these things are in my head, but I, I often don't think about them. All righty. I don't see any other questions coming in. So you are welcome to shoot me any questions after the fact, we'll get you all set. I really don't mind questions. Thank you for listening, thank you for joining and thank you for your patience and putting up with all of the, uh, the little blips here in our day. I'll see you again next month for the 1930s, which is going to be a very juicy decade. So thank you and happy night.